All right, next on our agenda, we have a presentation uh, concerning law enforcement priority ordinance. And uh, if you want to come forward, please, and you might want to. Just bring one of, scoop one of the chair up there with you, if you don't mind. If you would uh, please start with giving us your name and address for uh, sure. the record. Uh, hello, Mayor Austin. Hi. Hello, Commissioners. And hello, Marie and Buzzy. My name is Grace Henderson. I am a constituent here in Henderson, Kentucky. I have spoken with you all on this issue at great length as far as uh, my medical needs go and um, as far as finding some benefits. Um, with medical cannabis in general. Um, this is a good friend of mine, Tom Rector. He's come in from Louisville. He helped get the lowest law enforcement priority ordinance passed in Louisville in July of 2019, and happy to have him here with me. Okay. Proceed, please. All right. Uh, well, I'm Tom Rector. I'm from Louisville, and uh, my roots are actually in western Kentucky, though. My father was born in Island, Kentucky, if you're familiar with Island, so I spent all my summer McLean County. down, yeah, down in McLean County, been to Livermore, been across the longest bridge in the world down there. My grandfather actually built that bridge, so I do have some roots down this way. But um, Grace asked me to come down and help with this presentation on the consequences of cannabis prohibition and regulation. And as you guys know, this policy is changing across the country. Uh, it's actually changing pretty rapidly. There's bills at the federal government. Uh, the state governments, we now have 15 states that allow over-the-counter sales to adults, and there's 38 states that have medical bills. Um, Canada has changed their law there, and Mexico has too. So this is something that's, that's coming. And to be quite honest, we've been good citizens. We've been to Frankfurt. We've lobbied uh, the Frankfurt legislature for about the last seven or eight years, and they have failed to act on any type of legislation here, and that's why we're here, because we need your help. And what we're trying to do is correct a mistake, because prohibiting cannabis was a mistake, because prohibition doesn't work. So is this the... Mm -hmm. is it? Okay. Is it really? It's on the oh. side. Okay. Ah, there we go. Let's try this. No. No. Again, we don't want to, you know, take too much of your time here, but uh, we do want to go through our presentation and okay. just talk on, on some highlights here. Okay, give us just a couple of minutes here and we'll try to get this rolling. There we go. Okay, now that was ready. Works now? Thank you. Okay. Nice uh, job, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> Prohibition, you know, it just doesn't work. It sounds good. It sounds like a great idea. Alcohol prohibition today still sounds like a great idea. Oh, it's out and about well, but about 30 percent of the people in the country would vote for it. My dad being one of them. So you know we tried it and it just didn't work. And uh, the reason is because prohibition always results in stronger, more dangerous drug use and more violence in the streets. And when you regulate drugs, uh, it reduces the violence because it takes away the criminal market. Uh, when you look at alcohol prohibition. Again, we thought it was a great idea, but the first thing that happened is we had stronger alcohol because beer and wine production in the United States ceased during Prohibition because it takes up too much room. So when alcohol went underground, it all went to distilled spirits because, you know, a truck or a, a wagon full of beer will serve 100 people, a wagon full of whiskey will serve 1,000 people. So that was the first result, stronger alcohol. And you see the same thing with other drugs today. Uh, the cannabis is stronger now than it was because of prohibition. The growers decided, well, if we can make it stronger, put more of it into a smaller space, then we'll make more money. You see the exact same thing today with 
uh, heroin and fentanyl. They're stronger and more dangerous. The other thing it does is it reduces uh, respect for the law and for law enforcement because you probably have half a million people in Kentucky who will consume cannabis today. And if that many people are doing it, then the law is wrong and not the people. And it also uh, you know, reduces respect for law enforcement because we're tasking law enforcement to try to enforce laws they can't enforce. And so they catch one out of 100 people and the rest of them get away with it. Uh, prohibition always results in organized crime. And what we have today uh, is no different than Al Capone during the times of, of alcohol prohibition. Uh, the gangs that we have, the cartels, the drugs may change, but the actual uh, mechanism is the same. And so alcohol prohibition actually caused a huge increase in law enforcement deaths, and the most deadly uh, year for law enforcement in our nation's history was 1930. A lot of people don't know that. They think that, oh, law enforcement's under attack today, but really it's safer to be in law enforcement today than it's ever been. Now, there was a slight uptick last year with all the riots and stuff that we've had. And you can see with prohibition, you know, in the case of what happened in Louisville, I mean, our whole city's turned upside down because of a failed drug raid. And people try to paint it out to be police brutality or racism, but actually what it is, it's a failed drug raid that happened in the middle of the night where this young lady got shot. So the last thing is even we had tainted alcohol. The government actually tainted some of the alcohol that, that people consume. They poisoned it themselves, so they're poisoning their own citizens. And that happens today with some other drugs that we have. So current forms of prohibition today, we have criminal sanctions. We've arrested 25 million people over the last 30 years or so, uh, and it hasn't worked. You know, what was the result of arresting all these people? Well, we have 15 legal states, 38 states with medical, and it's changing across the country. We also have an eradication program. Once again, sounds like a good idea. But what happens in reality is if you go chop a chop down safer cannabis plants, you reduce the supply, which raises the cost, and that lowers the relative cost of other competing drugs. So we actually made cocaine and methamphetamine and heroin cheaper in relationship to, to cannabis. And then drug testing, I could talk to you guys all day about drug testing. And then once again, sounds like a great idea, but the way we created the drug test, we made the longest uh, detection time for the safest drug. So THC shows up for about 30 days on a drug test, most standard drug tests, and opiates, methamphetamines, those type of drugs only stay for a day or two, and alcohol is only on the test for, you know, a few hours. So if you only consider the bias that the drug test creates just towards alcohol use, you can already see it doesn't work because alcohol is a more dangerous drug. And I have every intention of taking down the federal workforce drug testing program. Uh, in the near future, because I think it will fall. I don't think you can have legal cannabis in the United States and end up uh, with a 30-day detection time for THC and widespread use drug testing. And then there's a prescription monitoring program, which we call CASPER in, the, in, in this state. And I wrote every legislator in Kentucky in 2012 when they were going to implement mandatory CASPER. And, you know, that's when you go to the doctor and for him to write a prescription, he has to go check your prescription history. And I told them, if you do that, I said, hassling doctors is not the answer because the cartels will be glad to step in and supply uh, street opioids, and you're probably going to end up with an increase in, in overdose deaths and not a decrease. Once again, it sounds like a good idea, but in reality, it doesn't work. And what ended up happening? Well, overdose deaths, as you guys are probably aware, have increased 50% in the last five or six years. So, again, it sounds like a good idea, but it really doesn't work. So, Dr. Gupta here, as I'm sure you guys have heard Dr. Sanjay Gupta, in 2008, he wrote an editorial in the New York Times saying why I would vote no on medical marijuana. And he got so much uh, input from people saying, no, 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 you're wrong. He went and he actually researched it himself. And what he found out, looking back through the history, is, and this is his quote, we've been terribly and systematically misled for the last 80 years in the United States. So terribly means this is a grave injustice. And as I said at the beginning, we're here to try to correct the mistake the government made. And systematically means that it was done intentionally. And it implies there's you know some culpability by the government. And if I may interject at that sure. point, one of the one of the most famous um, well patients that Dr. Gupta actually brought to attention was the story of Charlotte Figgy 
who is a, a little girl who suffered from severe epilepsy. So after speaking with her family and seeing the benefits that cannabis and CBD in general gave to uh, gave to her family, gave to her, and he ultimately decided to air that on CNN and, and tell people that he'd been wrong and, and hope to switch the minds in the right direction. Yeah, he did several specials on CNN where he's detailed, you know, all the medical benefits. So how were we misled? Well, we were misled to think that if we reduce the use of cannabis, that we'd reduce the use of our drugs, or the gateway theory. This was the gateway. But the reality is, the more we prohibited cannabis, the more hard drug use increased. And again, you only have to look at the increase in alcohol use due to the drug test and other, other uh, restrictions on cannabis to see that it's uh, counterproductive policy. So the solution is to allow adult medical use and medical use for, for minors to reduce hard drug use. And what we've seen, there are studies that back this up, and I'll show you two right here. These are two different studies. The top one was a study that was done based on uh, medical cannabis laws that had passed in the United States. And we have, obviously, a horrible overdose problem in, in the country. And what they found when they started looking at the overdose rates in states that passed medical cannabis laws that they saw there was almost a 25% decrease in the rate of fatal overdose deaths in states that had legalized uh, medical marijuana. Now, the bottom part study is actually a pill count study from Medicare Part D. Now, Medicare records all the prescriptions that they, that they issue. So these scientists, and this was actually done at University of Kentucky and uh, University of Georgia together, and these are actual numbers of pills per doctor per year. So with pain pills in medical cannabis states, they were prescribing 1,826 fewer doses per doctor per year. And Kentucky has around 9,300 doctors, something like that. And so you're talking about 19 million fewer pain pills that will be prescribed if they pass a medical cannabis law or cannabis legalization. And as you can see, they also found there's a number of other drugs that uh, legalization of cannabis or access to medical cannabis reduced, anxiety medicines, nausea, psychosis, seizure medicine, sleep disorders, and uh, depression medicine, stuff like that. So, uh, and again, this study was done at uh, the University of Kentucky and the University of Georgia. And one more thing on this. I've tried my hardest to get the government to come forward with the prescription monitoring data. Because like I said before, we have a CASPER program. Well, that's nationwide. 49 states actually uh, participate in the prescription monitoring program. So the government already knows whether this is true or not. This is just Medicare. That's not all the prescribing that's done. There's also, but, but the government has a database of every prescription that's been written over the last 20 years. And in Kentucky, it's only been mandatory, like I said, since 2012, but some states go back to 2000. So they already know for sure, and they just won't come forward, law enforcement won't come forward with that data. And you don't want to look at individual people's data, but the aggregate data would show a clear picture that you're seeing reduced numbers of medicines in those states. So this is the chicken or the egg argument. This is clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, and I'm not going to try to go too deep into this. but what this guy, Ethan Rousseau, who's the senior medical advisor for a company called GW Pharmaceuticals, they actually have two FDA-approved cannabis-based medicines, Sativex and Epidolex. One of them is similar to what uh, Charlotte Figge gets, it's, uh, and, and there are a couple people in the state that are on that medicine. But what he theorized is, is the underlying reason for these conditions a deficiency in the cannabinoid system? And so we all have a cannabinoid system. And it really wasn't even discovered until the 90s. Now, the war on drugs started in the 70s, but the first CB receptor was found in 91, and then later they found that we have them in our stomach. And so the, our body actually makes compounds that are very similar to uh, exactly what's found in cannabis. So the other underlying pathology is it that you have a deficiency, and so when you supplement that deficiency with cannabinoids, then it improves your condition. And that's your experience. That is my experience. Right. In, in, in my own experience, um, I have found quite a bit of relief from my symptoms um, with a combination of prescriptions and cannabinoids. I 
step back there and just made a list right now. I have um, 25 diagnoses, um, and I'm at 17 of them are theorized to benefit from cannabis in some form, including central sensitization, fibromyalgia, migraine, uh, Crohn's disease, chronic pain, chronic pelvic pain, uh, and abdominal migraines, osteoarthritis. Um, abdominal migraines have affected me uh, significantly over the last couple of years, actually since I spoke to you all in 2018. In 2019, uh, I woke up on New Year's Day, actually, having stayed home the night before and, and been a, a good girl, but I actually woke up in the middle of the night and ran to the bathroom and got sick to my stomach for eight hours. Uh, my body temperature dropped to 95.5 degrees, and this happened to me eight more times before June. Uh, when I went to the hospital about it, they did not know what to do with me. The last episode that I had at home, I actually literally laid on my bathroom floor and waited to die. Uh, so <laughs> I feel like um, if, if anybody can, can benefit from any of this, if, if this can help us manage any of our symptoms, then the, I should not be denied it. None of us should, should be denied it. Maybe it won't you know, help everyone, but if it can help any of us at all, then we deserve that opportunity. Well, the, the other thing is, it's, is the underlying pathology of the things that she has because she has a deficiency. There's a big difference between being an addict and having a deficiency that you supplement to improve your condition. So what is the lowest law enforcement priority ordinance? Well, it's a simple document. You have, what my information, you have approximately 45,000 people that live in Henderson. And those citizens, they're both citizens of Henderson and Kentucky and the United States. And so what it does, it's really a no arrest ordinance. And it's no arrest for minor possession of an ounce or less. Now we started in Louisville at half an ounce and that's what they passed. And then the county attorney came out and said, we're just gonna make it an ounce. And he told the police, don't bring us any of these cases. We're not gonna prosecute them. So you have three different, you have a legislative branch and you're the executive branch as the mayor. And then, of course, you have a, a prosecutor. And as long as you guys, you know, come to agreement on this, that we're just not going to give anybody records. Because it's more than just the arrest record. You can lose student financial aid. You can have, you can lose a job. You can have that record can have much more effect than just having to pay a $200 fine and spend a few days in jail or whatever. You, know, you can definitely, there are definitely other cascading effects to having that on your record. And so that's what this is. Things are changing, and this is just a stopgap measure for you guys to protect your citizens from arrest so they don't suffer these until Frankfurt and Washington get it together. And it's quite likely that you're going to see a federal legalization this summer. You know, the Moore Act passed, uh, which is the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment Expungement Act. It passed the House of Representatives. It went to the Senate. They didn't act on it yet. They'll have to re-up it in this coming Congress but it's quite likely that that will pass. So again, it protects the residents from other consequences related to it. It also sends a message to Frankfurt and Washington that Henderson's ready to move forward, that you're ready to stop criminalizing people for behavior that's really just normal behavior. And you prefer that your citizens not drive to Illinois, they'd rather spend their money here. You know, and this is a start to getting to a retail outlet or some retail, you know, uh, zoned businesses here in Henderson. Because right now, some of your residents are doing that. They're driving to Illinois it's, and spending their money there. It's an hour and ten minutes to Harrisburg to the closest dispensary. Right. And to be completely frank with you, the last time that I was there, 90% of the cars in the parking lot were from Kentucky. And the manager at the time told me that all of his rec sales are from out of state consumers because Illinois residents are able to get their medical card and they don't have the same limits that the out-of-state residents have. So an out-of-state resident can purchase, I believe it's a half an ounce, right? A half an ounce or up to 250 milligrams per day of edibles. Um, you could also purchase, I think it's one um, vape cartridge uh, and uh, one transdermal patch. Uh, we, we have a, a pretty long agenda and we've got a executive session that follows and also if you could I think we understand what you're asking we understand the situation kind of wrap it up for us 
Sure, sure. Yeah. Not a problem. No problem. Uh, the other thing it does, it encourages other municipalities in the state to pass similar legislation, and it creates a whole historical record that you guys have led on the issue. So there's the number of arrests that we came up with. We couldn't find the data for 2019 or 2020. Uh, I don't know why it's not been published, but we couldn't find it. But there's roughly 300 arrests annually in Henderson County. So that's the number of people you'll be protecting. And then this is a couple data on traffic fatalities. And there's next charts on overdose fatalities. These states have all legalized. I'll let you look through it. You have a copy of it on your own. But if you just notice that California and Kentucky and compare those two, California's actually had legal cannabis since 1996 when they first passed their medical law there wasn't very many restrictions and you can see their traffic fatality uh, rate is half of ours and if you look at their overdose rate it's about a third of what ours is so the slippery slope of legalizing cannabis causing some great sky falling in just doesn't happen so the economic impact just real quickly this is just the total sales in these markets their market is starting to mature I could have put tax data up there. There's lots of different types of, of taxation that you could look at, but that's just roughly the type of market that you're looking at. And I'm sure Kentucky would be a billion dollar market, probably bring in $100 million annually in taxes. It's not going to save your pensions. It's not going to correct all our economic woes in the state, but it will. it is a step in the positive direction. And then so our conclusions is cannabis prohibition is counterproductive policy. Cannabis is a natural medicine, it's therapeutically active, and the underlying cause of numerous conditions is an endocannabinoid deficiency. And the one point I want to make for sure is local government has to lead the nation, and it does all the time. You see it with the fairness ordinance. There's 20 fairness ordinances in Kentucky. The state hasn't passed anything yet. There's a no-knock warrant that was passed in Louisville as a result of Breonna Taylor's death. The state hasn't passed it yet. So, we're, we need local government to lead on this issue because the state government and the federal government lag behind it. So our recommendations is that you should recognize the numerous societal consequences of cannabis prohibition. You should protect your citizens by passing this ordinance. And time is of the essence because, uh, you know, these arrests happen every single day. And we very much appreciate you allowing us to come down and make this presentation. Thank, Thank you. For the opportunity. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any we, uh, questions? We're open to questions. We work with uh, we work very closely, government-wise, with the county attorneys, mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of the case in all of the counties. So we will uh, visit with our county attorney on that. We have a city attorney, but I think the county attorney actually uh, has precedence up in this particular case, and we will we will talk with the county attorney and uh, talk among ourselves and see if this is something that the commission as a whole would like to uh, pursue. Thank you very much, uh, I want to ask, is there, are there any of the commissioners that have any questions for uh, Mr. Rector or for Grace? I don't have any questions. But I do want to thank you for your time. And, and you know, before uh, Coming out in any direction on it, you know, I'd be happy to hear from the county attorney as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I would also like to add that I have spoken with Steve Gold about this issue, and he has let us know that he will support it. Okay. Uh, and, and you should probably should make an appointment to meet with the uh, county fiscal court as well. Yes, sir. Uh, of those forty-five thousand people about uh, that you listed up there. Probably uh, 24. 24, 25, or mm -hmm. uh, city and 15 to 25, 20 or county. So, you know, we probably would do something. If we did anything, it'd probably be something jointly. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Have a nice uh, Thank you. Thank you. trip back.